So maybe we should start with a question. What does it mean to be a whole man? It started in my head, moved into my heart, so now it's in my hands. My understanding of health, it started to expand. I couldn't do it myself. Men are struggling. We see men dropping out from work, school, marriage, church, relationships. We see the carnage all around us for men to not be their whole selves completely. I am Jerome Gay Jr. I am a husband, a father, a pastor, and author of several books. I'm also the founder of The Urban Perspective. I'm Dr. Malik Blade. I myself am a counselor, and I also manage a network of counselors by way of the Whole Brother Mission. I'm Rasul Berry, a pastor and documentarian, and we're the host of The Whole Man Project and the general editors of The Whole Man Devotional Book. The whole man is not an event. There isn't this point to where I can say, I'm a whole man, I'm done growing. I got it. No, it is, it is processional. It is continual. It is a lifetime process of maturation that embraces every aspect of my humanity. That's why we say head, heart, hands, and soul. Head, heart, hands, soul. Be Head deals with mental health and knowledge. That was a section that I had the opportunity to kind of oversee. And it deals with some aspects of mental health and psychology and how we can wed those things with our Christian faith. To discuss Head with me, I have three esteemed guests. First, Dr. Nee Addy. I'm a neuroscientist. I run a research lab at Yale School of Medicine. I'm also a mental health advocate. I host a podcast about topics at the intersection of neuroscience, mental health, faith, culture, and social justice. I also have James Perkins. I'm a psychotherapist in Raleigh. And I love what I do. And also show Baraka. I am an artist, author, I guess you can say. I like to say my title is a polymath, and I just basically get to make up what that means because people don't know what that means. So <laughs> But that yeah, it's just a creative expression in all types of modalities. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. So when we think about this idea of mental health, um, different things come to mind based on who you're you're saying it to. So for each of you, from a personal perspective, when you hear the term mental health, what comes to mind for you? Anybody? Well, I'm definitely not going first after this, so <laughs> I'm still what they say. Defer the to the scientists. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. I'll jump in. So I, I mean, I say as a scientist, mm -hmm. this is going to sound funny, but like I feel mixed when I hear that. Okay. I mean, one, I already study that. So in the lab, we're looking at addiction, depression, and anxiety. But I also think about how that term comes up in public. And like when I say that to people, people even have one of two reactions. One, they're really curious. I think all of us have had some experience with mental health challenges or we know someone who has. Then there also there's this, like, this pushback where people, it makes people feel uncomfortable, something they don't really want to delve into because they're, for a whole, a whole bunch of different reasons. Right, yeah. James, what comes to mind for you when you hear mental health? Well, as a therapist, you know, I have the privilege of holding space. Um, you know, I do work with individual couples, but I hold a significant amount of space uh, for African-American brothers. And what I often find is when they think about mental health, it is something that is almost like segmented from their sense of identity. It's like, I will get to it if I have time. Mm. And... Uh, when they are coming into the therapeutic space, it's often where they finally discover that, hey, I'm actually here because I've been ignoring this for so long. Now I'm actually forced to be here because it is, my mental health is impacting every other area of my life. Yeah, absolutely. What's the connecting point for you, Shaw? Growing up, I would have thought something that was daunting and just mm -hmm. scary, you think psychiatric wards. <laughs> Now I think of it more jacket. of like, yeah, just you was something like, oh, mental. No, I'm cool. I ain't got no. I don't need my mm. crazy. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> mm. Well, I grew up in a house of a football player, a professional football player, and a Black Panther. So you know, <laughs> we were just emotions. You know, we grew up in a kind of family where, you know, you scream at each other, and then the next minute mm. it was, you act like everything is okay. Yeah. And so that's the kind of behaviors that I perpetuated. It's mm. like you know, you just you either just act like things don't really affect you 
or you just kind of just move past them. You push past them, but you don't really confess and deal with it. But there was this one situation that I just couldn't just push past, and it's when we had our first son, and he had signs of having autism. And he was just like, okay, now what? What is, what's happening here? And so, you know, once we got a diagnosis and we kind of accepted the fact that, you know, we were going to be raising an individual for the rest of our lives who has this, um, this disability, if you will, not only is that something that I have to advocate, you know, for his life, but that, in, that affects a marriage. That affects how we yeah. interact with one another. And so that has been my most recent experience. And the reality of it is, is a lot of us wait till we're adults after yeah. we've caused so much damage. You turn around, you see the wake of your life, you see all these dead bodies behind you. <laughs> and you know what? Maybe it's not everybody else's fault. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's something wrong with me. And so I, I learned a lot about myself recently after going through some, some marital issues that, that can lead to divorce. Yeah. And so that kind of thing was like, you know what? I definitely need to figure out how to deal with the things that's happened to me. And so I will say, man, counseling, paying attention to my mental health, not only saved my marriage, but it actually saved my life in a lot of ways. We live in a very transient culture that tends to not focus on personal well-being, but more so productivity. And sometimes productivity can become the enemy of one's personal emotional wellness. Even more so, because in our culture, men take on the, uh, this idea of leadership and responsibility for not just themselves, but also others, which can lead to some self-neglect. As one is looking out for their responsibilities, they may not tend to their own personal wellness. Hearing all of you speak about it, what I've noticed is more often than not, men are being connected with us by way of a woman in their life. Mm. Sister, daughter, mother, wife. Same in my saying, practice. Yeah, saying, okay, he needs help. <laughs> I will validate that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so I wanted to talk to you about, as men, what do you think about this resistance that we tend to have related to reaching out for help or admitting a level of weakness? Have you observed that? And what do you think is the motivator behind that? You know, as a therapist, one of the core issues for the men that I, I work with is shame. This sense of um, inadequacy that they feel in having to open up, um, along with the other, you know, cultural, societal elements that reinforce that it is, um, that your vulnerability is not going to be honored, um, that it's not, uh, there's not going to be a space for you. And so, um, because they don't, and often it's uh, even reluctant to say this because men who don't have good community, oftentimes that shame is going to be exacerbated because, you know, if you don't have another brother that you can talk with or mm -hmm. friend where they can identify and say, you know what, I'm navigating some of the same things. And I think oftentimes for brothers, they feel like they, they are the only one navigating what they're navigating mm -hmm. through. Yeah. And so it could be very hard for them to open up. I'm wondering if it's not just a masculinity issue, but if it's a collective black community issue. Because I don't know right. any women yeah. in my yeah. life who also don't. sought counseling. Yeah, okay. I think it's maybe, you know, and, and, and once again, <laughs> no empirical evidence here, but <laughs> and, you know, as someone who just loves reading and you know investigating culture and history, I think about the distrust of medical institutions mm -hmm. in our in our communities. I think about the idea that oftentimes, like even when I talk about my son when he was diagnosed, all of the matriarchs of my family was like, "Well, you ain't nothing wrong with that boy, you know. Right. You know, Junior didn't talk right. to you seven years mm -hmm. old." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, now this is different. Like, my us, boy, right. he's doing something totally different from what Junior was doing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it, it's, it's a little bit of that shame. Um, it's, it's a little bit of that, you, you, we're a community, mm. but the authenticity of allowing people in our business. So it's a very, it's a veneer of community. But like, don't get too, too invested because I'm not about to actually like let you into the real issues mm. of my life. Yeah, we have a unique experience as black Christian men. Mm -hmm. right. So there's the barrier that exists for mental health in the black mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. It's probably even heightened as a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. there's also the skepticism with secular psychology right. yeah. exactly. and that's as Christians. All, yeah. So we have all that yeah. that can be a barrier. Yeah, And that goes back to what you were saying. I mean, even if we think about the history of just 
practices and systems that are in place in this country. I mean, even thinking about, you know, urbanization and, and the flight of different, you know, white, white flight and just, I mean, even going back to the new era and all the things that happened around housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people that have actually looked at that research mm -hmm. and looked at the mental health effects of putting groups of people wow. in urban housing without green spaces. Yeah. And yeah. what effect that has on people's mental health more Absolutely. likely to have depression. You remove all those types of things. So you have that layer. Then you think about all the mistrust. I mean, this is going back all the way to Tuskegee and other places. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, sometimes people say, oh, that, well, that's in the past. Why can't we get past that? No, no. The unfortunate, yeah. I mean, that still happens in different ways. So as people enter into mental health spaces or enter into any medical spaces, the racism that occurs, the mistreatment that occurs, that just reinforces all of those components. So again, there's so many layers to it as well. But then you think about the church as well, the black church. I mean, I think a lot of us know, you know, the power of a praying mom, people use Absolutely. that phrase. The women who have stepped in the gap in those spaces, and I think that creates mm -hmm. some more opportunity for women to be able to also explore the mental health and mental wellness. And we have to show up as black men into those spaces as well. So again, I'm not, you know, not to overcomplicate, but all these layers, like you mentioned, all yeah. play a factor. And then you get to the masculinity, the sports, and just the fact, like you said, the isolation. Mm -hmm. So many men, are going through the same things in isolation. So I remember talking with uh, Doug Milton, who is a former NFL safety, and he was talking about what he's been doing with his mental health organization, just to get people in the same room to talk. And for him, it's almost humorous to get a bunch of guys in the <laughs> NFL in one room, have them have a group therapy session, and like see the light come on. Like each individual person kind of sharing their own story, and then being, thinking that they're the only one going through it. Yeah hearing that everybody else in the room is going through the same thing, mm -hmm. but they never actually sat down together to have that right. communal conversation. It's poison in your mind, venom on your tongue, corruption in your grind, passivity in your lungs. It's the clashing of the cymbals, the bashing of the drums. It's the noise immature boys make seeking love. So put a song in their soul, affirmation on their heads. Speak love to the heart, put rest into their hands. Let the weak be strong. Let the strong understand that the village is made in the image of the whole man. Before working with the whole brother mission, I worked in universities. And one of the biggest things that pushed me in this direction was uh, working at a predominantly white Christian school. The diversity that was there was typically by virtue of the sports program. Mm -hmm. So you had black male athletes at the predominantly white right. school. And there was one student in particular who was experiencing a lot of uh, severe depression and suicidal ideation. So, you know, I was meeting with him to talk through some of it because he was on academic probation because of that. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories he shared was, yeah, you know, when I was having these suicidal thoughts, I texted my teammate on what I was feeling, mm -hmm. and his teammate texted him back, I'm with my girl right now, we'll talk about it later. Mm. Wow. So this idea of, I think what you brought up, I do see women show up for each other in a mm -hmm. way that we may, we may not. Um, that moment of vulnerability that was taking place for him and sharing with his teammate, and knowing probably, uh, as I talked with a lot of a lot of men that they're already had, having a narrative like, hey, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to take a risk. Mm. Mm -hmm. And to see it reinforced, like the brother teammate, somebody that he's probably thinking like, man, this my boy got my back. Right. I'll call you later. It's going to probably most likely reinforce like, yeah, it's just better to, to keep, keep it. these things mm -hmm. to yourself. Because yeah. you avoid disappointment, you avoid the rejection. To be a little charitable for the individual who responded with, uh, I'm with my girl. I think we also have to understand is that like, this brother probably didn't know what to say and how to yeah, care, yeah. you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes, um, the individuals we, we put ourselves around mm -hmm. may not be the best to, and you know, granted, you want to be open, you want to share, but you know, sometimes people are just doing the best with what mm -hmm. they can. Now, mm -hmm. if I were to call yeah. you Malik, and be like, hey man, I'm going through something. And you're like, hey, I'm busy. I'm, then I'll be like, well, hold up, brother. <laughs> like, you got yeah. answers. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You got answers, sir. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's critical. Right. And, I, and, I, and that's why I, yeah. I do, in some ways, have more ought with the church mm -hmm. and its yeah. lack of advocacy yeah. for people because, and I think a lot of it, can be that mm -hmm. seminaries aren't training people mm -hmm. properly mm -hmm. or that we just think pastoring is just the teaching of the mm -hmm. scriptures and not the actual shepherding and being a part of people's lives and invested. Yeah. 
and the lack of opportunity to allow counselors mm. into churches mm -hmm. to counsel people when a pastor is not adequate to do the job, yeah. you know? And so I just, I pray that churches will allow more spaces yeah. mm -hmm. for brothers like this to, to, to hold the kind of yeah. equity to be able to speak into the lives of folks like yeah. the pastor does, if that oh, makes yeah, sense. That's so good. I may get counsel for this, but oh well. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just gonna say it. Uh, <laughs> that oftentimes, uh, especially for uh, my clients who are believers, a significant amount of my work is really half of the time, sometimes just unpacking bad theology. Mm. But they've gathered from, and this is like, I don't think they've gathered from people that were maliciously trying to hurt them, but they they got theology that was uh, not fully complete. You know, the enemy, he, he knows how to tell, he will always tell the truth in the service of a lie. Mm -hmm. So he'll give you 98% truth and give you 2% lie, and that can really upend what you receive from what, um, what you're being taught. So one story, I was actually giving a talk, I think, maybe six, seven years ago at the university talking about aspects of mental health and faith. There was one student who raised her hand, she's actually studying biology, so she's already thinking about the biology of neuroscience and the biology of the brain, but she had an aunt that was going through a mental health challenge. And she didn't know how to talk to that aunt even though she was studying biology because the aunt kept being told the only reason she wasn't getting better is because she wasn't praying hard enough. Mm. Mm. So like for me as a neuroscientist, it grieves me to hear that because I think about all the things that God has allowed us to learn about the brain, ways we can right. navigate through that. And then to have this person who, yes, we believe in the power of prayer, the power of God to work through that, but to not avail themselves to all the other tools that we have. Now on the flip side, a couple of years later, I'm teaching a class to medical students at Yale, talking about the neuroscience of the brain, talking about what we do in the lab with addiction and thinking about all these cues, things that happen in the brain that lead people to relapse when they're trying to abstain. And I had a medical student who was basically trying to take a shot at the Alcoholics Anonymous approach and say, oh, Dr. Ad, this is all well and good, but what are we supposed to do with those individuals that think that being part of a faith community or a higher power can help them navigate through their mental health? Mm. It's now totally dismissive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of what we see God doing in our faith communities to help people navigate through that. So two very different reactions, but I always say that I feel like it's the same problem on both sides. Like saying this one approach only I'm going to ignore everything else. So for me personally, that's been one thing that I've tried to be really adamant about entering into those spaces and helping us think more holistically about how do we approach our mental health, our mental wellness in general, and how do we actually tackle mental health challenges when they come up? Do we use all the tools that God's given us or do we get stuck in one approach only? Either it's working or it's not working. I just got to try doing that one thing harder and harder and harder. Your pain and like see hope. We hope to normalize men prioritizing their own personal wellness. There are certain things that I think we kind of lean toward, which is serving others, work, and productivity, and things of that nature. And personal wellness doesn't tend to make the top of that list. We want to begin to normalize that. And we recognize that that can be done through things like therapy and mindfulness, but that can also be wedded with certain spiritual disciplines like Bible study, prayer, and fasting. You know what I mean? It's like the trigger. Nothing hurts more when you point to something and say like, this thing hurt me, or, or this thing offended me, or this thing caused me harm. And then for someone else to say, well, I don't see it that way, so do with it what you will. So yeah, I've had those conversations. I think some of the resistance to the mental health conversation in church is the assumption that it's completely other and there's no way to commandeer it for Christ's purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, but those that study the field and are also having that Christian lens will notice that a lot of times, in terms of practices that help improve someone's mental health, there is a lot of over overlap with what secular psychology would say and what scripture says. Just one example is like in Philippians 4, where we're encouraged to meditate and think on things that are Amen. of a good report Amen. and praiseworthy, um, meditate on these things. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It may not be worded that way, but a good therapist will also uh, look into your thought life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you right. thinking about? What are you meditating on? Um, because those things can take you up. Those things can also take you down. But how would you uh, tie those things together, uh, mental health, psychology, and, and scripture? Yeah. I th one of my favorite proverbs that I love and I use in my sessions is, it says, uh, a man's heart is like a deep well, 
but a man of understanding will draw it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I see that, especially in my space as a therapist, because I have studied what I've studied, because I have a grasp of scripture, I get to play that role of helping people see things that they haven't seen in their own experience. Because as I often say, you know, we, we've lived our story, but we don't often know it. Um, and the scriptures speak to that. You know, I think about the fact that um, out of all the people that God could have called a man after his own heart, he uses David. And I think in part, one of those reasons supporting just his, his own connection of mental health is that you see this wide expression of emotions throughout the entire Psalms. Mm. And what you often see is that David's emotional expression often ends up becoming the on-ramp on -ramp for a conversation, a prayer with mm. God. So you see him expressing the songs of happiness. Then you literally see this guy who was a king the man of the God's own heart mm -hmm. saying, Lord, I wish you would smack the head of mm -hmm. my enemy's kids against the rocks. Like, this is the guy you chose? <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, we're seeing this honoring of the emotion. Mm. I try to make this point that, hey, your emotions are like data points. They are giving you mm. information about what is going on in the inside of your heart you have a chance to decide what you do with that emotion, which is why Proverbs 4 and 23 speaks to guarding your heart with all diligence, mm -hmm. all diligence for out of it flows the issues of life. So I think this combination, uh, the Bible and psychology are complementary. I don't see them as antithetical to one another. Mm -hmm. I think they complement one another. And, you know, just my personal belief, hey, it's, I don't think it's, you can be spiritually mature by, while remaining emotionally undeveloped. I don't see how those can go hand in hand. Mm, 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 mm. Come on now, somebody. No. That was a word. That's good. That preach? <laughs> <laughs> I, almost, I almost shouted, but... Uh, yeah. There's room for that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just just to follow up. So I loved what you were saying about those passages in, in Philippians and just the importance. I don't see these as separate. Yeah. If anything, when I read the Word of God, I can see the ways that God has already given us tools in scripture that impacts mm -hmm. our health, our mental wellness, our psychology, as you were talking to. So even those things, you know, we do have some autonomy to, as the scripture encourages us to think about these things, but then also to know, as we know from psychological practices, like that starts a pattern. We can build those quote unquote, build those muscles. Yeah. And that also impacts our brain. So the fact that we take the time to do what scripture is guiding us to do, to think about these things can actually yeah. impact how we think about those situations in different situations, different circumstances. And there's so many other examples of that. One that I often like to highlight is the passage in Hebrews that encourages us to continue to be together in community, so much so as we see the day approaching. I mean, you can easily, as a neuroscientist, see how God is calling us to community. And there's so much evidence from the research about the importance of being in community. I mean, just from the psychological lens, that's the first important piece. If someone is going through something, as you know, just to have someone to be able to talk to is the first step. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even always have to be someone who's trained in you know, being a counselor or a psychotherapist, but someone who just knows how to listen yeah. and to actually listen without speaking. So I think yeah. so many of us uh, think we're listening, but we hear one thing and then we go on on this mm -hmm. long, different, you know, <laughs> different avenues about all the ways we're trying to, to, to provide help, just to sit back and to listen. And then just being in community, there's so much evidence that shows what that actually does to our brain. Just being in community with other people as we are right now actually impacts our brains. There's a molecule called oxytocin mm. that's released in the brain when people are in authentic community really? together, when people feel like they're on the same team. Mm -hmm. It was actually discovered because it's a, a molecule that's important for contraction when a mother goes into labor. Wow. It's also a molecule that's important for connecting and creating that bond between mother and child. But it's not just mother and child, it's also the family relationship. The interesting thing, you actually see this amongst sports teams as well. Mm -hmm. So if you have a team that's going out against a common opponent, you see that level of oxytocin rise. It's also important in terms of how teams actually can create that bond amongst themselves, but actually how we all navigate in community. If we're going through something challenging, we actually see a rise in oxytocin that helps us be empathetic and supportive to one another. So I take that say, look what God has shown us in scripture about the importance of being in community mm -hmm. and look how the science actually backs that up and reminds us about how God has actually equipped us as human beings to gain from the ways we can be in community together as well. That is so good, man. I was lost and confused, leaving a 
council of fools On my way to wholeness I met some wonderful tools Had a check up with a doctor who's enthused to commune Virtues all in tune, sitting in the waiting room Love was talking to anger, justice talking to grace It felt kind of fake, they all had the same face Patients saw me in a rush, put me on the wait list Walked me to my seat and sat me next to greatness I think about Western society. Western society obviously has a lot of that we can say is a blessing and a curse to it, but mm -hmm. the dissonance that is often communicated with science and Christianity, mm -hmm. a lot of what, you know, psychology, a lot of these intellectual um, advancements has to thank Christianity mm -hmm. for its blessing to give people, yeah. you know, these ideas of what, what is charity? What is mm -hmm. compassion? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to to care for victims. Mm. Like that's, those are, those are Christian principles that, you know, other yeah. parts of the world weren't thinking about. And so to say like psychology is, you know, separate from a Christian principle to me, it's like, oh, it's, it's exactly right. yeah. the Christian thing to say, I, I need to love God with my whole heart, mind, body, and soul. Like this is a yeah. Christian way of living. But there's the, the curse of the Western society is that we live in a success society. Like mm. we're fascinated with success. And I think oftentimes when I think about my own path and career, success is not an advocate for mental health. Mm. <laughs> and I think about scriptures like what profits a man to gain the world but lose his mm -hmm. soul. When you think about be anxious for nothing, these are all things that the, the marketplace promotes is to not sleep, to, to, mm -hmm. to continue to work. And the, the scriptures is, t is telling us to rest. The very principle of like the whole idea of a Sabbath is mm. to, you know, we pray and we Sabbath, not just as some flippant thing, mm. but this is an omission of our limitation. Mm -hmm. And I think mental yeah. health mm. is just that. It's an omission. Like, man, it's, I know there are capacities in which I can't, like I can't expand. I have to be able to come understand mm. there's a limitation mm. to me. So I, I pray, I think on these things as mm. you communicate it. I recognize that, as an artist, the world wants me to, to be ever present, to yeah. always tweet, to always post, to always be, hey y'all, here's my new song. <laughs> <laughs> song and, it's and, like, and it's like, I can never rest because the moment you rest, you become irrelevant. Mm. Yeah. And I think the Bible is, is saying yeah. the opposite. It's saying, yeah. no, when you, when you rest, you become more relevant mm -hmm. because now you're ascending the mountain to fellowship with me face mm -hmm. to face. And uh, G.K. Chesterton has this wonderful quote. He says, nothing fails like success. Mm -hmm. And wow. the moment wow. we yeah. really truly believe that and we trust that Jesus really mm -hmm. has our best interest at heart, and that means to be healthy, mm -hmm. like from a comprehensive perspective, yeah. I think we'll see more yeah. integrated and healthy lives. In attendance was Joyce, he said something that really snatched me. Show, try not to hate when other brothers have me. Peace gave me a stare, it lasted for a while. I learned something in the silence without exchanging a the sound. There's a difference from being quiet and being in denial. There's a difference between being heard and being loud. The doctor looked me over and he pointed out my cracks and said, relax, I'm a pro, I can work with all of that, behold. What kind of advice would y'all give to people who are like managing small groups and trying to create space for folks to confess or to, you know, not necessarily sins, but like to be honest about what they're feeling without the person who's sharing feeling like this is either going to be used against me mm. or there's some sort of punitive response. Or, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. like, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I would say I usually use this for men uh, because we tend to not have a lot of depth in our conversations, even if we've known each other right. 10 to 15 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it can apply in a small group context too. So in my first book, we had something called the communication pyramid. So think of a pyramid and you have these five levels. So at the top five uh, is cliche. Mm -hmm. So we, we Christians, so. <laughs> Bless and highly favored. <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. cliches like that, right? And then right under that is level four, that's facts, just sharing what you know. Mm -hmm. The Patriots won the Super Bowl. They did. It's an objective gotcha. fact. They won. Uh, three, we then have opinions. So you're sharing what you think about it. So it might be, I hate the fact that the Patriots won the right. Super Bowl, right? <laughs> uh, level two is emotions, feelings. And then level one is full transparency, sharing who you are. Mm. Um, and I do think a lot of times this can be in a work setting or even sometimes amongst men. We like to hang out around levels five and four. So it's just these cliches and facts going around and we're not really getting anywhere. Mm -hmm. And even in some small group settings, mm -hmm. yeah, no, absolutely. we might talk about this was the text from Sunday, this is the verses we're looking over, yeah. but we still haven't gotten down to sharing how we feel about things 
and who we are, levels Absolutely. two and one. So mm -hmm. I would think it's important for us overall to normalize that in our mm -hmm. culture. And I yeah. get it, there's some resistance because I don't know if this person is safe to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I do think it's worth the effort to try to facilitate that in your life as if it's a priority. Because it's mm -hmm. easy to say, I agree with what they're talking about. Transparency is good. Yeah. And then keep going, keep saying I'm blessed and highly favored, even though you don't <laughs> feel that. Right, 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 right. So putting in practice mm -hmm. vulnerability and creating spaces in your relationships for that uh, going both ways. Is there something that the mediator mm -hmm. should say or do mm -hmm. to draw that out? Yeah. And you probably can support this. I was going to say I think the leader has to start that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They need a... The, they need a space to step into. Mm -hmm. So as you lead with your vulnerability, which I know you would have no challenges doing, it actually physiologically gives your mind, mm -hmm. a, like, and you can talk about the chemicals behind that, but people feel led to jump in now that permission has been given. Mm -hmm. But uh, you have to start up, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would say two things, starting out, but then also creating, creating the space Mm -hmm. For that, so it's almost like you, I mean, not to make it too rule bound, but you have to create the ground rules mm -hmm. for others to be able to share that. Yeah. To say that when someone shares that, it's going to be again this this whole idea of listening without speaking, which sounds silly, but we mm -hmm. just don't do it. So, like to say when someone shares that, that good. we're all going to take it in and listen. Yeah, we're not going to judge. We're not going to try and correct it. We always we're not going to try and fix it. Yeah. We're just like even just to let it sometimes sit in the room. There you go. That's beautiful. As uncomfortable as that makes people feel. But how, like, how much that actually validates the person who's sharing. To say like, oh, I have space to actually get this out. Yeah. And to be able to share it here. So there, there is some management of it from the leader to say like, we need to create that. And if someone does try to step in and start trying to fix it, you, I mean, you kind of have to like, okay, and so sure I, I see where you're coming from. I know that. your heart, but yeah. this is the time yeah. just to step back. That's good. And let that yeah. space be there. But then also to make sure that it's stated in some shape or form, that's a confidential space as well. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that can mean having a follow-up conversation where if someone doesn't feel comfortable going into all the details or whatever, not be in that space. The other piece I would add is if someone goes into details and makes you as a listener uncomfortable, to also know that you have access to resources of people who can provide that support as well. And those are things that are, that are fine to verbalize, I would say. That's good. That pyramid is excellent. It is. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. And get the book. <laughs> Where can we purchase that book? <laughs> Why, thank you for asking me that. <laughs> uh, I think Sometimes you have to find it. It was a pleasure. Appreciate you. Right. Right. <laughs> we don't want this to just be an emotional moment, but we want to create long term systemic change and break the stigma surrounding mental health. And there are a couple ways to do that. One is by continuing the conversation in your community, but also reaching out to speak to a therapist if you are in need or referring someone else. We can continue this conversation together via our website, experiencevoices.org forward slash whole man.